This week on Georgia Traveler, we embark on a hayride through an historic country farm. How about that? Head down to the low country in Savannah for a little cooking clinic. Is it good job? Good job. Brave the ocean waves for a marine exploration. A nice teeth in that mouth. And visit a mountain lodge inspired by journeys to all seven continents. Lead the way, kitty. <laughs> Biscuit is a part of the experience. Georgia Traveler is coming right up. Let's begin this week's journey in Canton to a place where kids and parents alike can get their hands dirty and experience the good life on the farm. There are two locations here in Cherokee County. Both happen to be operated by the same family where kids can learn all about agriculture and farming the fun way. One is the Cagle Family Farm where I am right now. The other, right across the street, the Cagle Farmhouse. There's a story behind this house and hill. Yes, a farmhouse and windmill now occupy the grounds, and the current tenants are the Kegels. But legend has it that Cherokee Indians used to manage this soil and love this land. After the Cherokees were removed from the land in 1838, a couple of owners followed, including Ella Doss Bobo. Her nephew, Albert Kegel, bought the property from her in 1957. Now he and his wife, Bernice, share their family traditions and farm lifestyle with any children and adults who visit this cozy country setting. We want uh, kids especially. They don't have a place to go fishing or a place to do things that's close home. We try to guarantee every child they'll catch a fish. All aboard Albert's tractor train for a tomato and pepper planting experience straight out of the Tom Sawyer playbook. Albert digs the holes with his half century old hoe and tells the kids how much fun farming can be. In my garden is a lot of fun to set out tomato plants. By the time he's done explaining, he says the kids would want to pay him five cents for each plant. It worked for Tom Sawyer, and guess what? It works for Albert. But unlike Tom, Albert didn't take their nickels. How about that? <laughs> that sounds fun. It's been beneficial because it gives uh, people a place to go to see what farming activity was like years ago, and in some cases, less kids get out where they've never been on a farm. Now with Papa Albert's garden, it shows them, you know, growing vegetables and whatnot, which is something so many of the kids look at it from the standpoint of they're just getting uh, their, their food from the grocery store. You can buy some of the Kegel Farm products at the Garden Patch Market. It's as fresh as it gets, and you may even get lucky and buy one planted by one of these young farmers. Well, that's what, that's what a lot of people wanting to go back to, to know where the food comes from. So they're, they're looking to buy the food directly from the farmer who produced it rather than going to a store and buying it. After farming, it's off to the fishing hole. Time to dig up your own worms and try your luck. And there are a lot of worms in here. Who would have known? Hey, you're helping. You're pretty good at this. The main thing that we hope that children learn is how to be patient when they fish because you don't always just drop the hook in and they bite but we want to make sure that children uh, catch fish. Cause so many times they go to a big lake or somewhere and they never catch fish and they think this is for the birds. I'm doing this so when I see one. There's one, yeah, I see. Then it's over to try your luck in another field. Dude, look at this big old cheese ruby I found. For just a few bucks, you could strike it rich. These guys are keeping an eye out for rubies, quartz, in some cases, gold. It is gold, right? This looks like fool's gold. 
Look at that. That's for you. Look at that. That's cool school. Uh, oh, what does that make me? Well, oh. They need to learn about the gemstones and the gold that was part of our uh, uh, part of the culture here in Cherokee County. They can look at the guides and talk about the uh, gold and and how many people in Cherokee County used to uh, uh, dig for gold. Meanwhile, across the street, Albert and Bernice's son, Ben Cagle, runs the Cagle family farm. Here you'll find cows, goats, chickens, and a jumpy pillow. That's right, folks, one massive jumpy pillow. Here I was joined by my own family and a whole bunch of new friends who took a hayride tour of the grounds. Our able guide was Isaac. Now guys, these calves come in this barn when they're only two days old. That's when we start to hand feed them. They'll stay in here anywhere from three to five months until they learn how to eat their solid food like their hays and their grain. While on the hayride, Isaac will point out Tib, the talented border collie who herds the cows right up to the side of the hayride. You ever tried milking a cow or maybe even milking your thumb? Ready, one, two, three, four, five. Oh my goodness. So whether you tour the grounds by tractor, trailer, or Georgia traveler. All right, let's go see some cows. This cozy country farm is utterly excited about you stopping by. I want to thank you guys very much for coming out to Cagle's Family Farm today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here. I had so much fun on the farm that summer day that I decided to bring my family back for a little fall adventure. My son soon found the perfect Halloween pumpkin, then took on the junior jumpy pillow, and finally the whole family got quite lost in the corn maze. Good thing my oldest boy followed the clues and guided us out. Let's now join Cat down in Savannah to a classic getaway that just happens to have some of the best food in town, even with Cat's help in the kitchen. What could be better than a sightseeing tour along any of Savannah's historic streets? From the man-made beauty of the legendary architectural wonders, to the natural beauty of the city's iconic Spanish moss. There's something awe-inspiring at every turn. But perhaps one of the most notable icons of them all is the fountain at Forsyth Park. The water is the magnet, so is the park. Whether you're just out to push a stroller or, or have your morning run, it's where everybody goes. It's a neat mix of students to the old timers that have been going to Forsyth Park for, for years and years and years. And Forsyth Park boasts yet another favorite old timer that's also been there for years and years. From across the park, you look over and you see this magnificent, beautiful, kind of orange brick building. And the first thing is, what is that? That would be the mansion on Forsyth Park, an exquisitely restored 1800s Victorian Romanesque home turned ultra chic boutique hotel by Savannah native Richard Kessler. Welcome to the mansion on Forsyth Park. Thank you. May I show you around? Sure. The mansion is, uh, is one of our most popular hotels. Um, for a lot of different reasons. First of all, it's, it's almost more of an art gallery than a hotel. Uh, when you walk in, you're overwhelmed by the amount of art in there. It's just a spectacular place. But for Georgia travelers like me who come to Savannah to experience not only her southern hospitality, but her legendary cuisine. The mansion on Forsyth Park offers one more very unique feature. Welcome to 700 Kitchen Cooking School. I'm Chef Darren Sainert. That's right, the mansion on Forsyth Park has an on-site, state-of-the-art cooking school with weekly one-day classes for young and old ranging from French bistro to northern Italian and more. But if good old-fashioned southern cooking is what you're looking for, you're not alone. Our single most popular is by far low country cuisine because it focuses on the regional cuisine and people always enjoy a taste of their local area when they're visiting. Generally speaking, the so-called Low Country is a geographic region stretching along the coasts of South Carolina and Georgia. And the foods there are a blending of the cultures that passed through the area, like the English who established Savannah, the French Huguenots, 
the Spanish who brought with them domesticated pigs, and the West Africans brought over during slavery who introduced black-eyed peas, as well as foods that are indigenous to the area like wild Georgia shrimp, pecans, and even grits. Today's menu certainly reflects that, and Chef Darren wastes no time getting us up and cooking. To get started, I need two people for the shrimp and two people for the cake. Who are my first four volunteers? Kelsey, what do you want to do? Shrimp. Shrimp? So while Bobby and Kelsey learned the proper way to peel wild Georgia shrimp for our red-eye gravy with shrimp and grits on one end of the kitchen... Don't let the 13-year-old show you up for crying out loud. <laughs> Chef Darren got Jessica and Charles going on the ultimate Georgia pecan and praline angel food cake. There we go. Is it good good job. Good job? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can eat it just like that. Then it was my turn behind the counter. <laughs> Okay, just set it down when you're done. As my new friend Zachary and I tackled cheddar and herb biscuits. Is this supposed to be level? Um, <laughs> however you would do it at home. In the meantime, Catherine got started on the dressing for the black-eyed pea salad. Is, do you know what the classical ratio of oil to vinegar is for vinaigrette? Uh, no. no. Okay. <laughs> just make it up. Next up, Chef Darren led us through an in-depth knife skills lesson. Imagine, if you will, that that is like a big, the ugliest, nastiest bug you can imagine underneath your knife, and you're just gonna give a good whack and smash that sucker. Where we all expertly sliced and diced the veggies for our feast. Oh, what happened there? <laughs> well, most of us. Not exactly quarter-inch dice there, Kat. <laughs> Fortunately, it was time to head back to the counter to pull it all together as a group. Terry and I worked on the Wild Georgia Shrimp and Red Eye Gravy with Creamy Grits. Oh my gosh, they're good. We're gonna heat them up a bit more and get them good and hot. And once Kevin, Deborah, and Michael fried the green tomatoes. Hold those fingers up, what's going on there? Okay. The biscuits were out of the oh, oven. Oh, look at those beautiful biscuits. And the praline icing was on the cake. You don't eat your grits, you don't get cake. We all celebrated the completion of our Low Country Feast. Did you learn? Did you learn some tips and techniques that you can use at home? So the next time you're in Savannah, be sure to visit the 700 Kitchen Cooking School at the mansion on Forsyth Park. But ultimately, you got to learn to use your knives and your cutting boards correctly. Hey, Traveler fans. Want to sharpen your knife skills courtesy of Chef Darren Sainert at 700 Kitchen Cooking School? Log on to gpb.org slash Georgia Traveler to watch an exclusive webisode guaranteed to get you slicing and dicing like the pros. First off, let's talk about your knives. Um, probably the single most important tool in the kitchen, a chef's knife. This is the one you should be using 80 to 90% of the time. Not as commonly used, thank goodness, is this method. Okay, don't, don't want to do that. So go ahead and pick up your blade, pinch the blade between your thumb and index finger, and wrap your other three fingers around the handle. Put the thumb down first, other fingers right in front of that. Tip of the knife is down, we simply glide forward, walk your fingers backwards, and glide forward again. As you push forward, the knife is going to, if you have a sharp knife and you push forward, the knife does a downward motion for you. Okay, you guys are doing good? Use it like a a uh hot -huh, knife. Let me, let me focus. <laughs> we are now off to the Golden Isles where Ricky embarks on a marine life excursion through salt marshes and maritime forests, a place known as Skidaway Island. Skidaway Island, 16 miles from Savannah, is celebrated for its natural beauty, animal and plant life, and recreation. The first recorded human activity was in 2000 BC. Those settlers are long gone, but descendants of some of the island's original animal inhabitants are still here at the University of Georgia Marine Science Center. It's here where scientists study coastal Georgia's marine life, sea turtles, all sorts of fish, alligators, and today, so are we. Hey, how are you today? Thanks for having us. Glad to us. have you. Um, we're gonna take a look at some of our exhibits today. We have 12, we have a baby sea turtle, a bonnethead shark, seahorses, we have an interactive touch tank that you can touch a bunch of different animals in, and then we're gonna stand inside the lower jawbone of a humpback whale. All so right. come on. A room of fish tanks has black drum, red fish, also known as red drum, and clear nose skate. A bonnethead shark shares their space. Another tank is home to delicate seahorses. 
All of these are found and fished off Georgia's coast. Another tank is devoted to restoring an important food source for marine life, oyster reefs. They're crucial to sea animal survival because they protect them and improve water quality by filtering out nitrogen. But oyster reefs are disappearing from overdevelopment, destructive fishing practices, and agricultural runoff. So they're being restored. What you'll see in these oyster bags is that we put bags of shell in the water and then we'll get larvae that attach and you'll start to see larger oysters coming out and eventually you'll get a full reef that's restored. And this is how we're rebuilding We're rebuilding reefs. oyster reefs in All Georgia. Along the coast of Georgia. Yes. Now let's step from behind the glass. Fingers young and old can dip into a touch tank to feel a horseshoe crab, hermit crab, shells, and a spider crab. Now, this guy right here, he is a, what we call a stereus. It's a type of sea star. And right next to the touch tank is the jawbone we were promised. See how easy it would be to stand inside it? All right, we're going to take a look at our baby American alligators. These are keystone species on the barrier islands here in Georgia. That means these gators are crucial to the survival of many other organisms in their environment. They dig these elaborate holes and provide fresh water for animals on the islands. Without the fresh water collected in these gator holes, other animals on the island would have no water to drink. So they're really important here on Georgia barrier islands. And these baby alligators we got two years ago, so they're pretty little. How big will they grow to? They can grow upwards of 16 feet, so they can get very, very large. To get even more up close and personal with Georgia's marine life, we need to go to them. That means a trip on the Sea Dog, a 14-foot lobster boat used for educational trawls. A group of teachers is joining us to learn about teaching science, and a family tags along too. So what is a trawl? It starts with a net. I got to play with a mini version, but associate director and captain Bob Williams will drop a much larger net into the water, drag it along the floor of the Skidaway River intercoastal waterway, then see what we catch. But because he is a very sharp barb, we're going to put him back in the water. We find a burr fish. He's filled himself with water to keep danger away. And he's prickly, too. And as they get bigger, those prickles, those spines get bigger. This is a weak fish. Sometimes it's also mistaken for a trout. You can see the nice teeth in that mouth. Yeah, there. <laughs> this guy's just blessed. You might have done that. This is a menhaden. What's teeth? And there's a squid. And because we're feeding all these creatures to the animals back at the aquarium, we have to organize them. We stop sorting the fish just in time to visit with some curious dolphins. Back at the aquarium, it's not quite time to feed the fish, so we tour the island. The J. Wolf Nature Trail is a flat shaded trek that's less than a mile. It highlights the landscape wildlife and history of the Roebling family. Robert C. Roebling owned this land in the mid 20th century until he donated it to the state. His great grandfather, John Roebling, built the Brooklyn Bridge, which may explain why later Roeblings installed steel bars and cables in this 300 year old live oak. Walking down the pathways, there are still shacks where workers on the then cattle farm lived. This one was recently restored. An observation pier leads far out into the water, and you can always expect to see scientists doing marine research. There's even an old Roebling mansion that's still used for parties. We didn't want to disturb the wedding going on inside. And as we head back to the aquarium, it's finally time to feed the fish. Well, we're gonna feed the fish that we caught on the trawl this afternoon. Look at them go wild. Whether it's the fish, the science, the nature, or the history, there's something for everyone at the University of Georgia Marine Science Center on Skidaway Island. Over the past year, we're sure many Georgians have noticed our new team member braving the highways and back roads of the Peach State. Turning heads from Tunnel Hill down to Thomasville, our new ride has been a dependable companion. And you know what? We haven't even named it yet. 
Any ideas? Go to www.gpb.org slash Georgia Traveler or visit us on Facebook if you have any good ideas. Now it's off to the hills of Dahlonega where I check into a quaint mountain getaway for a worldly retreat. Have you ever wanted to travel the world without leaving Georgia? Well, that's impossible, but you can live vicariously through someone else's travels when you visit this 12-bedroom bed and breakfast in Dahlonega known as the Lily Creek Lodge. It's good to have you here. Thank you, thank you. This Bavarian-style B&B nestled right in the old gold mining hills of Dahlonega was a dream come true for Sharon and Don Basic. The happy couple spent years traveling the world, soaking up culture from all seven continents. Don unfortunately passed away in recent years, but as you tour the lodge, you'll notice every continent is represented in the separate room designs, a unique way for Sharon to share her and Don's memories with their guests. I've been very lucky. I've been to all seven continents, been to all 159 counties in Georgia. Wow, that was I haven't done that. I don't think, I don't think <laughs> that's my job. That. So you've taken you, you and your husband's world travels and turned it into this bed and breakfast that represents every continent on Earth. That's true. But then we have some extra countries from Europe, obviously, you know, because mm -hmm. it's fun to do a French room and an Italian room and a Picasso British room. room. There's a story behind almost everything that I've got. So we are in the Asia room. It's the oh, Geisha, yeah. that's right. It's called. We call it the Geisha Suite. It's got a small kitchen, nice size bathroom, shower only. Mm -hmm. And it's the only one with a private balcony. Yeah, where you can see everything. And I see why it's called the Geisha Suite. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I see the, the pillars. We must be in Greece. That's right. And this did come from Greece. We, we had that shipped back from Heraklion, which is really Crete, the island off the coast. We have the uh, Antarctica room and okay. Morocco for Africa okay. and Outback. That was the most recent one we did, too. I have guests who've stayed in every room. Really? They come back year after year. So after you have picked your continent of choice, it's time to step outside and fully experience the lodge's amenities. Trails are spread throughout the nine acres, patrolled and protected by Sharon's on-site kitty cat, Biscuit. Okay, Biscuit, show them what you do. Lead the way, kitty. <laughs> Biscuit is a part of the experience. No matter what room you come to, you are there. And now she wants down. <laughs> There you go, there you go. These grounds were Cherokee Indian country centuries before the settlers came and discovered gold in the region. In fact, less than one mile from the lodge is a place known as the station or the stand. An historical marker has been erected as the only memory of this spot where in 1931, the United States began the forced removal of the Cherokee Indians from this region. An infamous relocation program known as the Trail of Tears. A brief walk from there, you'll find what's left of Auraria, Dahlonega's long-forgotten sister city that boomed when Georgia's first gold rush began in the 1830s. But unlike Dahlonega, Auraria quickly became a ghost town when the Georgia gold rush itself died down. Just down the hill from the main lodge, you'll find the pool where Sharon and I decided to rest our feet a little bit. The water comes from our spring, so it's nice, soft water. Yeah, I bet, I bet. It's Look my you. favorite room in the house. We've had weddings and receptions down here. It's beautiful, yeah. You hike a little trail, it pays off here in the end. That's right. And saving what may be the best for last, home cooking from Sharon and her trusty helper, Pam. The apple lasagna. She makes something different every day. I devoured the surprisingly healthy apple lasagna for breakfast in the main dining room. But some other Lily Creek lodgers opted for breakfast in the trees. The tree house, you know, it's not real high up in a tree and yeah. it's safe because you don't climb a ladder. It's regular staircase with a handrail. 
so, but it's nice when you get up there. It's on the side of a ridge. Canadian bacon and brie quiche. The apple lasagna. Oh, okay. And zucchini squares. Wow. You're very welcome. I have enjoyed my stay here. Wonderful. It's been sort of a late life project. Yeah? So I'm glad you liked it. I loved it. I loved it. I look forward to coming yeah. back. So my belly was full, my feet were rested. It's fair to say my journey around the world was complete. Well, that's it for this episode of Georgia Traveler. We hope you join us next time. Until then, pleasant journeys. Oh. Whitney? Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.